What a great song. Just to invite you this morning to consider what if. And if uh, you already know the God that was caught you, not by surprise, but by grace, uh, this morning just to be further equipped and encouraged that that God is there and he is real. We have a great privilege to have with us somebody I've learned from for years and just this morning had a chance to meet personally. We've talked on the phone several times now, but uh, just this morning I got to shake his hand and personally thank him for the way he's built into my life. Uh, Dr. Craig has written more books on this topic than you have read. <laughs> Close to 50. I was asking this morning, his, his author page on Amazon has, has almost 50 listed. He, he says it's just above 30. I go, bro, you, you've forgotten how many books you've read, ever written, rather. And, uh, and I want to tell you, the rest of my life, I will be learning from Dr. Craig. I'm glad to learn from this morning. He is the professor of research philosophy at, at uh, Talbot University in California. He has uh, graduate degrees at several universities around our country and world. He studied in England. He studied in Munich. He studied in Brussels. Uh, he is one of the brightest minds uh, in the world today. And specifically, he is a great gift to those of us who cannot always uh, entertain some of the discussions that he can, that we can learn from him. Would you warmly welcome with me Dr. William Lane Craig. Uh, Thank you, Craig. Thank you. <laughs> even uh, you sit over there. I think they want you on that side. All right, very good. Uh, even threw on his cowboy boots for us this morning. How about that? <laughs> he lives in Atlanta now with his wife uh, and has a website called reasonablefaith.org. I say that to you because I want to make sure you know uh, that that is a resource that is incredibly rich for you. Um, you can go to reasonablefaith.org. You can see uh, videos of his past debates with some of the world's leading atheists, the ones that have the courage to debate him. Uh, you can read numerous articles, listen to constant podcasts, several of which he recorded this weekend. And uh, I would highly encourage you to put reasonablefaith.org as one of your favorites and, and to uh, use that resource consistently even as I, I do. Dr. Craig, um, we'll tell him more about resources of yours that we've made available to him this morning. But uh, let's just start with this. Um, there are, there are a number of books that have crashed under the scene with the neo-atheists, the new atheists. It's a, a radical, evangelistic atheist. Mm -hmm. They're not just willing to sit back and say there's no God. They now want, they feel like it's their duty to help you understand there is no God. Richard Dawkins, most famous among them, wrote the book The God Delusion. Yes. And so let's just start this morning with, uh, with a response to that book, The God Delusion, and arguments for uh, the intellectual defensibility of belief in the character, nature, and existence of God. Okay, very good. And let me begin just by saying how delighted I am to have the opportunity, Todd, to be with folks here at Watermark this morning. I'm in town, as you said, for uh, purposes of recording podcasts for Reasonable Faith, but being here this weekend gives me the opportunity to share this Sunday morning with you, and so I, I'm grateful for that. We are humbled you're here. When I read The God Delusion, I was very interested in the early chapters on the existence of God because I wanted to see how Dawkins would respond to the principal arguments for God's existence that I know are defended by many eminent philosophers today. And I must say, I was shocked and rather disappointed by the superficiality of his critique and analysis. The fact is that he didn't deal with many of the strongest arguments for God's existence, and those that he did deal with, he dealt with in a very superficial manner. And I think it's important to understand why this is. Professor Dawkins is a professional biologist. He's an expert in his area of specialization, but he's not a philosopher. And so when he speaks to philosophical concerns like arguments for God's existence, his opinion have no more value than the opinion of an untutored layman. He is a layman when it comes to these, and it shows in the kind of criticisms he offers. And I think, unfortunately, in our culture, certain people have a certain cachet because of their prominence, perhaps in their field of specialization. But we need to realize when they get outside of that field, they really have no expertise in these other areas at all. Plus, he's English, and they always sound smart. They do. <laughs> if you have a British accent, yeah. you just sound intelligent, don't you? <laughs> Okay, so, so in his book, uh, he, he goes through and, and you say he just gives very, uh, you know, uh, I guess, elementary arguments against the existence of God. Why don't we walk through um, what you would share in response to him? I know a number of folks have tried to get Dawkins to get up and discuss with you and debate, and he has been as of yet unwilling. 
Yes, that's right. He's uh, resolute in his refusal to do this. He says that a debate with me might look good on my resume, but it wouldn't look good on his. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I don't. It, probably he would struggle. So, so let's just walk through um, maybe a primer, and and it, it won't seem like a primer if this is the first time you've looked at some of this, but but just the the best arguments for the existence right. of God. I think that there are quite a number of good arguments for God's existence. Arguments that make it reasonable to believe that a transcendent creator and designer of the universe exists who is the locus and source of absolute moral values. So let me just outline a few of these arguments. One would be the contingency argument for God's existence. And this argument basically goes like this. Premise one, that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or else in some external cause. Secondly, the universe exists. So from those first two premises, it follows that um, the universe has an explanation for its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or else in some sort of an external cause. The third premise is that the uh, best explanation for the existence of the universe is a personal transcendent mind, from which it therefore follows that a personal transcendent cause of the universe exists. Now that's just an outline of the argument. In order to flesh it out and defend each premise, you'd have to do more work. This is one of the most popular and oldest arguments for the existence of God in Western philosophy. And I was shocked in Dawkins' um, uh, book, he doesn't even talk about this argument. He, he just completely ignores it. And yet I think this is a very good argument for thinking that there is a personal, transcendent uh, cause of the universe that explains its existence. Okay, so when you, when you talk about a, uh, uh, a transcendent personal cause, just, just explain that to us uh, okay. briefly. The idea here is that everything that exists has some kind of explanation why it exists. Um, either it exists by a necessity of its own nature. What would be an example of that? Well, many philosophers think that Mathematical objects exist in this way. Things like numbers and sets and other mathematical objects. If these things exist, they don't have causes of their existence. They simply exist by a necessity of their own nature. It's impossible for them not to exist. Other things are contingent in their existence. That is to say, they have external causes for why they exist, that explain why they exist. Examples would be things like mountains and people and trees and chairs and galaxies, these have external causes. And the point is that everything that exists has an explanation that exists, uh, why it exists, either in an external cause or in some sort of uh, necessity of an, in its own nature. So that's what we mean when we talk about uh, an explanation of something's existence. And the argument is that since the universe doesn't exist by a necessity of its own nature, the universe is is not a necessary being like a mathematical object. It must have an explanation in an external cause. And this cause would have to be something that is beyond the universe and therefore beyond space, beyond time, beyond matter and energy, a non-physical, immaterial, spiritual entity which has brought the universe into being. And the only thing that we know that could fit that kind of description would be an unembodied mind, a consciousness, a, a sort of transcendent consciousness without a body that brought space-time and all of its contents into existence. Okay, so you're moving now in, in, into uh, the argument from creation, the cosmological argument a little bit in the sense that we're saying now this uncaused cause, this, non, this thing that didn't have to be here is here. So, so we'll talk about the second argument that I know you present, which is the cosmological argument. Right. It's closely related to this argument. The, the, the first argument, the contingency argument, doesn't presuppose that the universe had a beginning. The universe could have always been there, for all this argument cares. But it's saying that since anything that exists has an explanation, there must be an explanation for why, say, an eternal universe exists, rather than just nothing. And that would be found in, as I say, a transcendent cause. Now the second argument, the cosmological argument, focuses on the beginning of the universe. And it goes something like this. Uh, premise one is that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Things don't just pop into being from nothing. 
Secondly, the universe began to exist, and this is supported by both philosophical arguments and contemporary science. And from that it follows number three, that therefore the universe has a cause. And again, this leads then to a transcendent being beyond space, beyond time, beyond matter and energy, who has brought the universe into being. And this is why, I guess, the recent discussions about the beginning of the universe, the, even the idea of a Big Bang, mm -hmm. okay, uh, it was such a big deal because it did say that this universe that's here has not been eternal. It does have a beginning. This is the remarkable thing about what happened during the 20th century as a result of Einstein's general theory of relativity and its application to the universe as a whole, scientists discovered that the universe is not infinite in the past. It is not eternal going back in time. It had a beginning, which is an absolute beginning, not only of our universe, but of all matter and energy, of physical space and time themselves, and therefore, as I say, points to a transcendent cause beyond the Big Bang, beyond the universe. Okay, now playing the role of the skeptic, it's okay, so the universe had a beginning, we're fine with that, but the beginning was so, uh, I can't say infinitely long ago, but no. let's just say uh, immeasurably long ago that uh, I'm going to argue that maybe through time and through chance and random events that we've brought about this fine-tuned universe that we have, which gets into the third argument right, that's for the, the nature. Ar yeah, that's the third argument. Now, as we, if we stick to the second one, it's not immeasurable in the past. It's about 13.7 billion years ago, a finite time. And it wasn't as though there were random events occurring in time. There was no time. Time and space come into being at the moment at which the universe begins. There were no events prior to the, the Big Bang. It represents the absolute origin of space, time, matter, and energy. So that uh, skeptics uh, gambit just doesn't work. It contradicts the, the theory, the model. Great, and so just, just to clarify, when you even talk about the 13.7 billion years ago, you're not even talking there about Genesis 1. You're talking about if you go back and you, you, you lay normal physical properties and normal processes, and, and we work that through history, it would look like it's 13.7 billion years well, ago. That, that's absolutely correct, Todd. There is a kind of cosmic time that as scientists call it or astronomers call it, that measures the duration of the universe. The universe is like a clock. It's, it's, I think it's God's clock. It measures the amount of time since the beginning, and that's about 13.7 billion years, according to current astronomy, uh, that, that is the time that the universe has existed. It's just incredible to think that this has been discovered, but this is what contemporary I, cosmologists I even, say. Even the skeptics would say that, that use Darwinian theory and evolution and things like that, and that they look at the, 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 the fine-tuning, which is a, a right, phrase I know you've used before. Now. Let's go to that. Okay. Well, the, the third argument is an argument for design based upon the fine-tuning of the universe for life. And it goes something like this. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Second premise is it is not due to physical necessity or to chance, from which it follows logically three, therefore it is due to design. So explain number two. In other words, the universe doesn't have to be uh, beautiful and ordered. Is that, was that what that number two is? That's correct. What scientists have discovered is that from the very moment of the Big Bang, the universe was fine-tuned with literally an incomprehensible precision and delicacy for the existence of intelligent life, such that if these constants or quantities had been altered by less than a hair's breadth, uh, life would have been impossible, and there would be no life of any sort throughout the entire cosmos. And the question is, how do you best explain this, this appearance of design? Well, Physical necessity would say the universe has to be that way. It, it must be finely tuned. But that is extraordinarily implausible because you see these finely tuned uh, constants and quantities that we're talking about are independent of the laws of nature. They, they are not determined by nature's laws. They're just arbitrarily put in at the beginning inexplicably. So they're not physically necessary. Now somebody might say, well, it's just due to chance. It's just a lucky accident. But the problem with that alternative is that it has no appreciation of the fantastic odds that we're talking about here. For example, if the 
subatomic weak force had been altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, that's 10 followed by 100 zeros, the universe would not have been life permitting. And there are a dozen or more of these kinds of constants and quantities, all of which have to fall into this exquisitely narrow range of life permitting values in order for the universe to be life permitting. So that the idea that this happened just by chance is just um, infinitesimally probable. In fact, I think non-believing uh, statisticians and philosophers have said there hasn't been enough time in that 13.7 billion years for, for that type of chance to bring about the kind of order that we're seeing. Right. I, I mean, to give you an idea of the numbers we're talking about, there have been only around 10 to the 17th power seconds in the history of the universe. And now we're talking about odds like 1 out of 10 to the 100th power. And, and this is just one parameter. And there are, as I say, many of them. So, so uh, in, in this conversation, um, the, the argument from order is what you think is one of the strongest arguments for the e existence of an intelligent designer of some yes, kind. Yes, and it's not just I who think this. This is something that has become really all the rage in current cosmology, that this subject of the fine-tuning of the universe, and scientists are baffled by this, and those who want to resist design as the best explanation are frankly adopting fantastic metaphysical hypotheses to avoid this. Well, we've, one of the things I've come to is they say, okay, our universe isn't old enough to explain this, so they go to the multi-universe exactly. theory. Exactly. And explain the multi-universe theory very quickly. Okay, the idea here is basically this. If the odds are too small that in one throw of the dice you would get a certain result, then what you postulate is many throws of the dice. The more times you throw the dice, the better your odds of getting a certain result. So. The idea is that in order for our universe to be explained by chance alone, what you do is you postulate an infinite number of other parallel universes, which are undetectable to us. We have no knowledge of them, no way of detecting them, but they are randomly ordered. All of the val values of the constants and quantities appear somewhere in this world ensemble of universes. and so by chance alone, somewhere in the world ensemble, a finely tuned universe like ours would exist. And I, I think it is a compliment to the power of this design argument that otherwise sober scientists would resort to metaphysical hypotheses of this sort simply in order to avoid a divine designer. And in fact, uh, the movie Expelled has Richard Dawkins on it, and, and in that movie, uh, ben Stein is interviewing Dawkins, and he kind of goes to this direction and even says to him, so, so what is your explanation if it didn't happen here? And, and he goes back, and I think he even refers to aliens that are in one of these universes that decided to bequeath some of that order here, and, and in effect, he, he pushes him a little bit on that and, and leans into it. It's an interesting watch if they want to rent the movie Expelled and see the person who says you're deluded if you believe in God tell you what he thinks you should believe in, which is even more fantastic than the explanation of a uncaused cause, creating order for the purposes of revealing himself. Let, let's, let's go to uh, another part of this argument. Uh, it's, the, it's the next one that you list, which is the moral argument. And that, that really gets into, I think, what's, what's underneath a lot of why they think we're deluded if we believe in this God. Talk about the moral argument. First. All right. The moral argument for God's existence goes basically like this. Premise one, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. If there isn't a God as your absolute standard, then everything becomes socio-culturally relative. Moral values are just ingrained patterns of behavior that have evolved through biological and social evolution. So if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Premise two, objective moral values and duties do exist. Some things are really wrong. Rape, uh, torture of a little child, uh, molestation, hatred, cruelty are really wrong. Similarly, love, generosity, self-sacrifice are really good. And from these two premises, it follows number three, that therefore God exists. If objective moral values and duties cannot exist without God, and objective moral values and duties do exist, as is evident in our moral experience, 
then it follows necessarily that God exists. Yeah, what, so what would you say very quickly to somebody who says, and Hitchens says this, we'll talk about him in a second, he's saying, look, I don't need the idea of God to make me good. Why do you insist that I've got to believe in God to be good? Okay, this is a, a very widespread confusion that you will encounter every time you share this argument. The argument is not that belief in God is necessary for morality. The argument is that God is necessary for morality. The existence of objective moral values and duties doesn't depend upon your belief in them. They exist independently if they exist. The, the argument is that God is necessary as a foundation for objective moral values and duties. But if God exists and there are objective moral values and duties, then they exist independently of whether you believe in them or not. In particular, they exist for the atheist because they don't depend on whether the atheist believes in God or not. These are objective realities. So the argument is not that atheists are bad people or that they can't live good and decent lives or that in order to live a good life you have to believe in God. That's not the argument. The argument is that in order for objective mind-independent moral values and duties to exist, you have to have a foundation in God. And isn't that where the discussion goes? If you reject the idea of God, and we therefore reject, even though I say there are some, I don't need God to be moral, but the question then becomes, well, what is moral? And I might have a list that doesn't match up with yours. If we reject this, this foundation for morality, and the foundation is just what I in my gut think is right, because, because there are those that would say that, that for instance, sexual um, morality is part of what you, because you have a foundation of theology and God believe, yeah. but I'm telling you that's repressive, it's puritanical, and it's unnecessary. And so I still have a morality. I just, my morality is different than yours because my base is different. Well, see, that person is affirming the first premise that if God does not exist, then objective moral values don't exist. It's person relative. You have your code, I have my code. What he's really denying is the second premise, that objective moral values exist. He says they're person relative or person dependent. But notice when he says, that's repressive, that's intolerant, that's wrong, he's affirming the objectivity of those moral values, tolerance, open-mindedness, fair play. So that it's very, very difficult to deny the objectivity of moral values and duties because those who typically do so affirm the moral values of tolerance, open-mindedness, and, and so forth. And so one of the greatest dangers of this, and this is, I think this is central to a lot of the discussions that, that we're going to have with our friends out there today, uh, if people say, well, don't legislate your morality, don't tell me what I have to believe, how, how would you respond to somebody that says that? Well, I would say that's not my purpose in this argument. I'm not trying to legislate morality in this argument. What I'm simply saying is, that you and I share a number of moral values and, and duties that we both recognize, like the goodness of other people, the intrinsic value of human beings. We ought to love our children rather than torture them and, and mutilate them. Uh, and what I'm offering you, my non-Christian friend, is an objective foundation for those moral values that we both share and recognize. And on your view, you've got the right values, by and large, but you don't have any foundation for them. They're just sort of floating in, in the air. And so I'm offering you something to make your world view more uh, effective and more consistent. Okay, so let's just say I go, okay, so I, I don't need your God to have this morality, but let's just say you're saying that morality does beg the existence of God, and I grant you that. But, but my okay, God... Then you've just, self, you've just contradicted well, yourself. I'm you said I don't need God. God. I'm saying there's a God that's there. Okay. But let's now make a transition. All right. Why do I have to swallow this Christian God? Because, ah. because this now is, is much really where I want to get. Okay, you've convinced right. me there's a God. All right. All right. And, and so some of the other arguments from God we'll, 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 we'll not go into right now, the, the ontological, uh, but, but, but the Christian God. Right. What I've said so far is consistent with a sort of generic monotheism that Jews and Christians and Muslims would all be happy to affirm that there is a creator and designer of the cosmos who is the source and locus of absolute moral value. Now the question is which of these monotheisms is true, if any? And what I would argue is that God has revealed himself decisively in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who claimed to be the Son of God 
and the absolute revelation of God and whose radical personal claims were publicly vindicated by God by raising him from the dead. So you're going to run right to the resurrection? Yes. Okay. So the resurrection, Paul, Paul had a point when uh, he said, and, and so should you, all right? <laughs> Uh, but but, but, but Paul, Paul said, look, if the resurrection didn't happen, we above all men are be pitied, we above all men are fools. So, so the resurrection event, Let, let's, uh, let's, I know you have a slide in case we got here, so let's walk through what you think are the best arguments for yes. the resurrection of Jesus, because if the resurrection event happened, it does seem to set him apart. Oh, it does, <laughs> uh, 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 clearly. All right, uh, as a result of my doctoral work on the historicity of the resurrection in Munich, uh, I discovered that there are four facts which are acknowledged by the wide majority of New Testament historians today. And I want to emphasize this. It's not just evangelical or conservative scholars that recognize these facts. This is the broad uh, mainstream view of New Testament criticism today. And these facts are, number one, that uh, Jesus was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea, uh, that this tomb was then discovered empty by a group of his women followers on the Sunday morning following the crucifixion, that thereafter various individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead, and fourthly, that the origin of the Christian faith owes its existence to the belief of these early disciples that God had raised Jesus from the dead, a belief that they came to share sincerely and suddenly despite every predisposition to the contrary. And so the fact is, how do you best explain these facts? And I would... All right, let me just interject yes. here, because my okay. question is this. So you're saying the historicity of that event is, is not a live discussion. Well, it's a, it's a live discussion. I don't want to say this is unanimous, but what I said is that it is the majority view by far. And what would you say about this event in antiquity? Uh, and how it compares to other things that nobody has any issue with whether or not they believe uh, you know, with Luther in, in the 1600s or taking it back further to the Caesars in, in uh, you know, B.C. Rome, yeah. that they existed and, and the acts of Mark Anthony and all that. Well, it, it's difficult to compare totally different events in terms of their evidential um, attestation. But N.T. Wright, a very prominent New Testament historian, in his book on the resurrection of Jesus, uh, uh, some, after about 700 pages of discussion, he says that in his professional opinion, the empty tomb and the post-mortem appearances of Jesus are so well attested as to be virtually undeniable and are comparable to the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 or the reign of uh, Augustus Caesar. Uh, this is just astonishing that the evidence for the resurrection would be comparable to indisputable events like these. So somebody that says that the only reliable testament to that is the New Testament, that would not be an informed position. Well, it's not that it's an, in, an uninformed position, it's that it is based upon a false presupposition. And that is that the New Testament documents somehow shouldn't count as historically reliable documents. And that's simply a false presupposition. When New Testament scholars look at the New Testament, they aren't treating it as a wholly inspired book. They're treating it as what it originally was, just a bunch of separate documents, letters, biographies, and so forth, written in the Greek language, handed down out of the first century, telling this remarkable story about Jesus of Nazareth. And we have far more historical information about Jesus of Nazareth than we do for most major figures of antiquity. Yep, that is key because I think that's where folks go. They go, well, you can't believe those guys because they're part of the conspiracy. Right. Okay. That's, that's uninformed. It is uninformed. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and give, give me your best 15 seconds on why that's uninformed. Well, this used to be held back in the late uh, 18th century among certain English deists and German rationalists. And basically, it was exploded and rejected universally by scholars since then for a couple of reasons. One is that it is anachronistic. It reads the disciple situation through the rearview mirror of Christian history, thinking that they would fake a resurrection so that Jesus could be the Messiah, rather than putting yourself in the shoes of these disciples themselves. When you do that and look at what they faced from a perspective of a first century Jew, 
the crucifixion was a disaster for these men because Messiah was supposed to throw off the enemies of Israel and establish David's throne in Jerusalem, not be humiliatingly executed by his enemies. Moreover, there was no connection between being the Messiah and being raised from the dead. The resurrection was a Jewish hope that would take place at the end of the world, not of an isolated individual in history. So the idea of a conspiracy is simply a failure to understand the mentality of a first century Palestinian Jew. That would be one problem. The other problem is that there's no doubting when you read the New Testament the sincerity of these men and women. They were ready to die for the truth. And did. And many of them did die. Yeah. And so you, you cannot say that this was the result of some sort of a deliberate hoax or conspiracy. There's no doubt when you read the pages of the New Testament these people really believed this message. So, so go forward, and, and, and the best explanation for the reason that these guys really believe it is because... Right. The, I think the hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, which was their explanation, the one the eyewitnesses gave, is the best explanation. And what I would do here is compare the resurrection hypothesis with alternative hypotheses, like the conspiracy hypothesis, the wrong tomb hypothesis, the hallucination hypothesis, and you would assess these hypotheses using the standard criteria that historians use. And I think what you'll find is that the resurrection hypothesis has greater explanatory power, wider explanatory scope, greater plausibility, it's less ad hoc or contrived, and so on and so forth, and so emerges as the best explanation. Okay, wonderful. Anything else in the resurrection that you well, throw out? Just as I point out in premise three, the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead entails that the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists, from which it follows that therefore the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists. That is to say, the true God is the God revealed and proclaimed by Jesus of Nazareth. Which then brings you back to your moralist, or my conversation with me as a skeptic, which says, therefore, that God is the God to whom you are in account and whose morality you must be subject to. That's right. That does mean then that we can turn to the teachings of Jesus to tell us what God demands of us and what uh, his moral nature is. Okay, well, let, let's talk about the moral nature of God because this is the second great book that has rushed onto the world in the last four or five years. It's Christopher Hitchens, God is Not Great. Because this God that Jesus speaks of, uh, this God that Jesus claims to be, lets unspeakable horrors exist. We, we know about the girl recently in California for, yeah. what, 18 years, was kept in a shed and birthed two children who grew up in a shed. We, I mean, I can go on and on. It takes no creativity to list all the horrors that we're consistently exposed to in the media today. And God is sovereign over that? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. If that God right. is God, then he's my devil, as been famously said. Right. And so Hitchens is, is there to say not only is he immoral, he is irresponsible and asleep. Yes. I, I would respond to this by saying we need to draw some distinctions here concerning what philosophers have called the problem of evil or the problem of pain and suffering. I think there's a distinction, Todd, between this problem as an intellectual problem and this problem as an emotional problem. And I think emotionally there's certainly no doubt that the evil and pain and suffering in the world uh, occasion great doubts that God exists. But I have to say that when I consider the problem philosophically as a purely intellectual problem, I think it's extraordinarily difficult for the atheist to mount a convincing argument that the evil and suffering in the world renders God's existence either impossible or improbable. Okay, lay that on us. There are different versions of the intellectual yeah. problem of evil. One is the logical version, and basically what it says is that God and evil are logically incompatible with each other. They're like the immovable object and the irresistible force. They, they can't both exist. If one exists, the other doesn't exist. It can't exist. And since evil obviously exists, it follows that God cannot exist. Now, the problem with this argument is that there's no contradiction between saying God is all-powerful and all-loving and evil exists. There's no explicit contradiction there. So if the atheist is saying these are implicitly contradictory, he must be making some hidden assumptions that would bring out this contradiction and make it explicit. So the question is, well, what are those hidden assumptions that the atheist is making? And it seems to me that there are two. He's assuming that if God is all-powerful, then he can create any world that he wants. 
And secondly, he's assuming that if God is all good, that he would prefer to create a world without evil or without suffering. And both of these hidden assumptions need to be necessarily true in order to show a contradiction between God's existence and the evil in the world. And the problem is that neither of those assumptions appears to be necessarily true. For example, uh, does God's being all-powerful mean that he create, can create just any world that he wants? Well, not if he chooses to give creatures free will. It is logically impossible to make someone do something freely. That is as logically impossible as making an unmarried bachelor or square circle. So there may well be worlds that are impossible for God to create because in them the creatures would freely perpetrate evil and, and harm upon each other. And if God wants a world to have significant moral agents in them who achieve moral goodness, he may have to put up with a good deal of moral evil as well. So that first assumption is just not necessarily true. And similarly, the second assumption, if and God let is... Let me interject yeah. with that. So what you're basically saying is that because God's going to create a perfect and good creation, that perfect and good creation must have in it uh, creatures that are, have the ability to do things that are good, which include love, and in order to be able to love, you've got to have the ability to choose to not love. That's exactly right. In order for there to be moral goodness in a world, you've got to have more than robots or puppets. You've got to have free agents. And once you do that, then things can get out of, out of control in the sense that these agents can perpetrate evil and harm upon one another, um, which God could prevent only by removing their freedom of the will, in which case he removes moral goodness as well. Which makes it a, a moral world, which... Right is not a perfect world. Right, it, it would be a world without any sort of moral goodness. So uh, it's simply not true that God's being all powerful means that he can just create any old world that he desires as the atheist seems to assume. And the second assumption I don't think is necessarily true either. That is that if God is all good, then he prefers a world without evil and suffering. We all know cases in which we permit evil and suffering to occur for some greater good that can be brought about. C.S. Lewis once uh, remarked, I think very aptly, what do people mean, I'm not afraid of God because I know that he is good? Have they never even been to the dentist? <laughs> and of course, Lewis wrote that before Novocaine yeah. was used when they drilled on your teeth. We know cases where we allow pain and suffering to occur for some sort of greater good. Every parent, I think, knows that fact. So that ass second assumption just isn't true either. And therefore, the atheist has failed to show any sort of logical inconsistency between God and the existence of evil. In fact, we can actually show that these are consistent by adding a third proposition, which I think is on the uh, screen. Namely, God could not have created a world which had as much good as the actual world, uh, but with less evil, and God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil that exists. As long as that's even possible, it proves that God and evil are logically consistent. And therefore, I'm very happy to be able to tell folks this morning that the, this logical version of the problem of evil ha, is widely, almost unanimously regarded today as resolved. Uh, even by atheist philosophers, they don't press this problem anymore because they've recognized that it's just impossible for the atheist to prove it's impossible for God and evil to coexist, and it's very easy for the theist to offer an explanation or an account of how they might be co coexistent. In fact, when uh, I was with you in downtown Dallas, when you uh, discussed this with Christopher Hitchens, and while Hitchens was winsome and hilarious and uh, gave lots of anecdotal stories, at the end of the day, he could not argue against the existence of God and even acknowledged what about the Christian solution to evil. Yes, that was one thing that was surprising about Hitchens, yeah. wasn't it? Was that he had the honesty to admit that, yes, at the end of the day, this argument really doesn't go through. What it has, again, is simply emotional force. Yes. But you see, as a philosopher, I'm called upon not to say how I feel about something, but what I think about it. And when you think uh, about it... That's what men get in trouble with their wives right well, there. Well, we, we, you granted, but you you're, realize we're not that. dealing and with And I tell wives. my wife I'm a philosopher. I'm not supposed to feel. <laughs> Let me explain to you what you don't understand. I've tried that. That doesn't yeah, work well. well. My, my, wife is, my wife has learned to argue logically with me. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, goodness. All right, so uh, yeah, Hitchens, I think he said that, look, the Christian argument for evil is cogent, it's coherent, if it was true. And, uh, and then I think, I love the way you summarized that discussion, debate. It wasn't a debate because he didn't come prepared. Do you remember what you said to him at the end of that? Well, I think I do. What, uh, are you, what uh, do you remember? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think what you did is you basically said, Christopher, and I think you were going to be together with him shortly after that. Right. We had a, a debate scheduled at Biola University just two weeks after this panel discussion in Dallas. Right. And so you said to him. I said, after summarizing the arguments and his failure to refute them, he was seated to my left. And I turned to him and I said, so I hope, Mr. Hitchens, that when we meet in two weeks at Biola University, you have done substantially more study on these arguments so that you can discuss them in a more significant way. Yeah, you basically <laughs> undressed him. You basically said you just acknowledge that everything I've said is true. You're not, what you have is no really philosophical or intellectual support, and, and I couldn't even debate you. And the funny thing is, he, he didn't do that homework. No. Of he showed up unprepared because at Viola's what, Because well. what Bill Maher does, what, uh, what, what Christopher has done, is you're right, they appeal to the emotion. Yeah. They use humor to distract. Ridicule is one of their most important weapons. Satire and ridicule. And that will persuade people in a way that often argument will not. Right. Because people, unfortunately, so often don't think logically. They, they don't know how to think logically. That's why I love that song that Sasha sung about what if you go deeper than your simple-minded friends yes. and begin to poke holes in the logic. Yeah. You suddenly discover that all of this atheist rhetoric is just that. It's mere yeah. rhetoric and emotional appeals. Yeah. Which, boy, it sure helps me sleep well until I'm honest. Uh, I mean, it, it allows me in the public square, but laying in bed at night, I think the simple-mindedness pierces our hearts, and that's God keeping, reaching out, drawing you back, saying, hey, consider me, away from the humor and away from the ridicule. Yeah. I am there. All right, two things just to wrap up, Dr. Craig, and, and, and we could do this all day. I mean, yeah, I personally... And I, I do want to say before we wrap up that we're, we're just scratching the surface here, folks. I mean... This is just skating on the surface. If you want to go deeper, there are fantastic resources available on all of these arguments and fuller discussions that are available uh, on the internet that you can access. Well, that's what I want to, I want to just say, and, I, and I'll inject this too, because he did not ask us to have his books here. I said, I want them here. And so we've got, uh, whenever we do this, rather than make you run out and, and, and purchase them, we get the books, and just for today, if you want them, we sell them at our cost. In fact, we sell them a little less than our cost to make the number round. Uh, if you want to buy Dr. Craig's books, Reasonable Faith, uh, those are available back there with some other resources to get you started. But let's be honest, Reasonable Faith may not be the, fir the best first step. Right. It's not a beginner's book. It's more <laughs> intermediate. That's right. But it, 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 is, it is intermediate. There, there is, yes. yeah, there's not, I mean, he's done works that are advanced, but, but tell them the best resources. If What would you say to the church to get in there to be winsome, to be ready to give a sound answer yes. when they're asked. If you're a beginner and want to learn more about how to defend your faith, I would say take a look at a book like Paul Little's book, Know Why You Believe, or Lee Strobel's book, uh, Case for the Creator and Case for Christ. These are excellent introductory books that are very substantive. They've yes. got good content, but they're written on a beginner's level. There's also loads of free resources on our reasonable faith Dot org website that are available to anyone who would like to access them. Gang, it, it is not just your option, it is your Christian duty. Uh, I will never study the historist, historicity of the resurrection at the University of Munich in Germany. But I do need to be conversant about the historical evidences for the resurrection of Christianity. It is the final apologetic, apart from my own transformed life, that I need to be fluent in. And, and I hope that you are inspired by this man's life work to, to get in the game and to realize that no matter how deep you dig, there are sound answers. And, and use Dr. Craig as your resource to go with your intellectual friends. Uh, Christianity is intellectually defensible, yes? Absolutely. I think it stands head and shoulders above any other philosophy or ism that you might care to hold. Okay. so. Give your two minutes to the person who is here, the skeptic. Uh, make your appeal to their heart. 
Um, uh, you know, we, we just beg the believer to get in the game, to be ready to give an answer. Yeah. But what would you say to the person who, who needs to go beyond uh, just their questions and walking well, away? The, the great American philosopher William James once made a very profound statement that I like in this regard. He said, we may be in the universe as dogs and cats are in our libraries, seeing the books and hearing the conversation, but having no inkling of the meaning of it all. And I think that the skeptic needs to ask himself, how do I know that I'm not wrong? That I'm like this dog or cat in a library filled with knowledge and with meaning, and I, I simply don't apprehend it. There are those who claim to have found this meaning and this source of existence, and they can offer intelligent, defensible arguments in support of this view. And therefore, I think you owe it to yourself to begin to look into it. If this message is the truth, if it's really the truth, then it is the greatest news ever announced that the infinite God of the universe should love you and want you to be his personal friend. There could be no higher status that a human being could enjoy than that. And so you owe it to yourself to look into it. If you're sick of being rabid, thick with fleas, scratching yourself and licking yourself and wondering why. <laughs> you, you can't get that in Munich right there, Dr. Craig. You gotta come to Dallas for that kind of logic. Then I wanna tell you, I wanna, I wanna invite you in. And I wanna, I wanna tell you that, uh, that there are people that have done that themselves and have had fleas and they've met the great healer and uh, has called us to be something great and he has restored and is restoring the glory that we have lost so we're glad you're here and believer if you're in the game um, get in it deeper uh, if you're here as a skeptic or a friend we've got an entire team that dedicates themselves to reasonablefaith.org and others it's an apologetics team that wants to sit with you we've got explorer classes where you can step in and begin to discuss these things in a very safe environment one of the reasons we started watermark is because we wanted this to be a place where you could come and ask questions and not be seen as disrespectful or unintellectual great men ask great questions and great women ask great questions but wise men and women sit around to see if there are great answers. And we tell you there are. And uh, I tell you to go get them. I tell you to learn them. And by the grace of God, respond to them fully. Let me pray for you and thank God for our morning. Father, thank you for a chance just to be together today, for a chance to gather with friends. I thank you for the giftedness of Dr. Craig, the way he has given his life to learning, and not just to learning, but to living. I thank you that his life is as defensible as the truths for which he speaks, even as it should be. I thank you that he has spent as much time in sanctifying Christ as Lord in his life as he has, filling his head up with learning. And I pray we would follow his example, that this morning I could say, imitate him as he imitates Jesus Christ, who uh, spoke and reasoned with men, but in his perfection also died for imperfect men. Lord, I pray we would follow you, and when we live in a way that is indefensible to a secular and uh, finite mind, that we would, with gentleness and reverence, be prepared to give an account for why it is we follow the King of Kings, whose tomb is empty, who created us and died for us and provides us a way back to you. I pray that my friends here this morning would consider him, and if they have considered him and called him king, that they would follow him with all of their heart. In Christ's name, amen. Make yourself available as resources and have a great week of worship. We'll see you.